Joining us, uh, joining us this morning from Austin, Texas, is the founder and president of the Foundation for Research on Equal Opportunity, Ovik Roy, also a contributor to Forbes magazine and a former policy advisor to three presidential candidates, Marco Rubio and Rick Perry in 2016 and Mitt Romney in 2012. Uh, Ovik Roy, you're here to talk about the Affordable Care Act. Thank you for joining us. The Senate Republicans want to include in their tax reform bill repeal of the individual mandate. What do you think about that idea? I think it makes a lot of sense. I mean, one thing you have to remember about the individual mandate is it's played an outsized role in the fiscal debates about both Obamacare, replacing Obamacare, and tax reform because of quirks in the way Washington works. The official budget scorekeeper in Washington, the Congressional Budget Office, believes that if you repeal the individual mandate, 16 million or 13 million is the latest estimate, 13 million people would voluntarily drop out of the insurance markets because they're no longer being forced to pay a fine if they don't sign up. Most actual observers in the real world don't believe that that's the case, but because the CBO believes that that's the case, there are all these massive fiscal savings that come from including the individual mandate in tax reform. And the Supreme Court famously in 2012 ruled that the individual mandate is a tax, and that's a big part of why it's compatible with this legislation that's before the Senate Finance Committee or the full Senate now. What does the individual mandate do, and what has been the impact of it? Great question. So uh, under Obamacare or the Affordable Care Act, what the individual mandate does is it says you're required to buy health insurance, which is defined under the Obamacare with certain criterion in terms of what kinds of insurance qualify for that. Uh, there are certain exemptions. If your income is below the poverty line, roughly, if you don't file income taxes because you don't have to, or if plans are unaffordable in your area, representing a certain percentage of your income, you're exempted from the individual mandate. There are other loopholes and exemptions. But broadly, most people are required to buy health insurance, either from their employer, from Medicare, from Medicaid, or on their own, or pay a fine. And the fine is $695 a year or 2.5% of your adjusted gross income, whichever is greater. So the fine gets larger as you go up the income scale. What has been the impact of the mandate on the cost of health care and health care, health care industry? Uh, another great question. So uh, in, the, in terms of the real world research that's done, the view of most economists is that the individual mandate is having a very modest to, to almost no effect. There was a, a, a paper published by Jonathan Gruber and others, Jonathan Gruber may be well known to your viewers as one of the people who was considered the architect of Obamacare. He published an article a few years ago in the New England Journal of Medicine saying there's basically no evidence that the individual mandate is having an effect in terms of encouraging people to sign up for coverage. What's encouraging people to sign up is that a lot more people, particularly at the lower end of the income scale, can now buy coverage at a discounted rate because of federal subsidies, whether on the Obamacare exchanges or through the Medicaid program. So the real world effect is minimal. In theory, the hope was, the reason why Democrats enacted the individual mandate in the first place is because the way Obamacare's regulations work is that it doubles or triples the cost of health insurance for younger and healthy people in order to make health insurance less expensive for sicker and older individuals, such as those with pre-existing conditions. The end result is that a lot of those younger and healthier people have a lot less incentive to buy health insurance because it's become more expensive. And the individual mandate the role of the individual mandate was to uh, force or prod those individuals, those healthier and younger individuals, back into the market. But because the fines are low and because of all these exemptions and because the mandate hasn't really been enforced that strongly by the Obama administration or the Trump administration, most people aren't really seeing the individual mandate as a reason to buy insurance. They're looking at the premiums, the cost of that insurance, and saying it's too expensive. I'd rather pay the fine if I have to than pay multi-thousands of dollars for insurance that, that doesn't have a lot of value for me. Now Republicans are moving to repeal that mandate by tying it to the tax reform bill. Here's Senator Claire McCaskill, Democrat of Missouri, at the Senate Finance Committee this week, arguing what impact repealing would have on health care. I'm reading right off the CBO score. 179 billion in reduced Medicaid subsidies. Uh, well, there are no cuts. Uh, Beg your pardon. That's where the money's coming from. Where do you think the $300 billion is coming from? Is there a ferry that's dropping it on the Senate? What? The money you're spending is coming out of Medicaid and subsidies to people who make less than 50000 
So you're trying to shop this baby like you're giving a $43 billion saving to people who make $50,000 well, a year? Just so you know, CBO said that that's, that's, a, that's the people who are leaving Medicaid. Mr. Chairman, you're And that's you're what they estimate is going to happen. So you there's are nobody cutting Medicaid. You are spending $318 billion to make tax cuts for corporations permanent. That money oh. is coming from the very people you say you're saving by eliminating $43 billion in tax penalties. Now, I'm from Missouri, and I'm just telling you, I was not a great student in math. But I will tell you, this is not a good deal. Ovik Roy, then you have the uh, j the committee, the Joint Committee on Taxation yesterday with their analysis saying uh, President Trump and Re Republican lawmakers have been heralding their bill as a win for hardworking Americans. But the JCT report cast doubt on that claim. Tax increases for households earning 10000 to 30000 would start in 2021 and grow sharply. By 2027, most Americans earning 75000 a year or less would be forced to pay more in taxes, while people earning more than 100000 a year would continue to pay less. Most of the hit, they say, to the poor and working class Americans would come from the Senate Republicans pushed to insert a major health care change into the tax bill. How do you respond? Yeah, so uh, let's take both of those separately. So first, the exchange between Senators Hatch and McCaskill. Factually speaking, Senator Hatch is right and Senator McCaskill is wrong. So what the, what the individual mandate repeal does is it means that people will no longer be fined to buy insurance. Now, the Congressional Budget Office believes that there are five million people today who are signed up for Medicaid, which is effectively free. Medicaid's a free health care program for people who are lower income. Uh, the CBO believes that people will drop, five million people will drop out of Medicaid if they're no longer being fined for not signing up. Uh, most people in the real world, again, don't believe that that's the case. Why would you need to be fined to sign up, sign up for a program that doesn't cost you anything? And why would you drop out of that program suddenly if there suddenly was no threat of a fine? So the reason why the CBO believes that there will be less Medicaid spending under the tax bill is because that 5 million people, those 5 million people would drop out somehow and that there'd be less Medicaid spending because there'd be fewer people enrolled in Medicaid voluntarily, not because uh, the Republican bill cuts Medicaid spending. So Senator Hatch, again, factually speaking, has the argument there, not Senator McCaskill. And that gets us to the, uh, the report that you were quoting. I don't know who wrote that report or wh where it was published. It was, in the again, it was in the Washington Post quoting the, the Joint Committee on Taxation. Okay, so uh, there's some factual errors in that piece, too, because, again, uh, the way this is working is if you are signed up for Obamacare subsidies, if you're signed up on the Obamacare exchange, you're buying insurance there, and you're getting some subsidies, those subsidies uh, come to you in the form of a tax credit. And so if you voluntarily drop out of the market because you don't want to buy Obamacare insurance, you will no longer have to pay a fine for that, the individual mandate penalty, which is also a tax. And you will no longer get the benefit, quote unquote, of the subsidies, which are tax credits on the Obamacare exchanges. So the people who would face so-called tax increases in the way that this is all being defined by the Washington Post are not actually people who would have to pay higher taxes. They're people who would voluntarily forego a tax credit to subsidize coverage on Obamacare because they don't believe that Obamacare has value for them. So that's a voluntary decision to, quote unquote, forego a tax credit. It's not that those people would somehow have IRS agents knocking on their door saying, hey, you, have, you owe us more money. That's not how it would work. Let's hear what our viewers have to say. We'll go to Al first in St. Robert, Missouri, Democrat. Hi, Al. Yes, ma'am. I like to ask this stupid. Your grandfather we lose everything to what the public trying to do to us. But now you trying to tell us that Obama is crazy. You are crazy, sir. And Wait, well, hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm, I'm going to move on. Let's let's keep the conversation civil. There's no need to call people names. Sheila, kiss me, Florida, Republican. Yes, I was wondering why you keep calling it a fine when the Supreme Court has already decided that it is a tax. Congress does not have the right to levy fines, has the right to levy taxes. Uh, that's a great point. Uh, in the statute itself, in the Patient Protection Affordable Care Act, in many places it's called a fine, it's called a penalty. Um, it's not really called a tax that often, actually, because uh, when uh, the Affordable Care Act was being written and debated and enacted, uh, the Obama administration wanted to promise Americans that 
no one under $250,000 a year in income would face a tax under Obamacare. In fact, according to the Supreme Court, the individual mandate is a tax, one of many taxes in the Affordable Care Act that affect people earning less than $250,000 a year. So there was a lot of politics around that in 2009, 2010, when the Affordable Care Act was being, uh, was being enacted. Uh, but as you say, in the Supreme Court's uh, view, it's a tax, and that's why it's in a tax bill today. Uh, Mike is watching in Wickleaf, Ohio, Independent. Did I pronounce that correctly, Mike? Name uh, your town. That's, Wick that's Wickleaf, Ohio, okay. uh, Greta. That's pretty, you were pretty close. Okay. That's good enough. Good morning to you and your guests. Good morning. Uh, a few things. Uh, since they're going to repeal the individual mandate, what this will do is create free riders. When these people without health care show up at the emergency room, people such as myself who do have health insurance, by the way, as a retired operating engineer, uh, we have health insurance that I pay for. We will be the ones that have to pay for the free riders. Now, uh, let's be honest. There was a mandate put in during the Reagan administration that hospitals have to accept into their emergency room, people that even if they don't have health insurance or no means to pay for their health care, they have to be accepted. Now, repeal the mandate that hospitals have to accept people without insurance. That's way, that way people such as myself don't have to pay for free riders. Look at the people that were shot in that horrific thing in Las Vegas. A lot of them have had to set up GoFundMe accounts to pay for their health care because they have no way to pay without insurance. Now, it, like I said, let's be honest. If you're going to repeal the individual mandate that's going to make free riders, let's repeal the mandate that said, says hospitals have to accept people for free health care. Uh, great question, and it represents a widely, widely held misconception about uh, so-called free emergency room care. There's a couple points to make. The first is that, uh, as a taxpayer, you're paying for the so-called free riders either way. Uh, if they get free emergency room care, like you said, yes, maybe uh, your insurance goes up a little bit to, to pay for that. But if you uh, pay for Obamacare-sponsored insurance, that, how does that fund it? That's subsidized by taxpayers. In fact, the amount of money that's used to spend to cover the subsidies under Obamacare is far greater than the cost of uncompensated care in the emergency room. Not only that, but actually all the evidence is, both with Obamacare and also Romney Care in Massachusetts, was that the expansion of the Medicaid program in particular led to increased use of the emergency room for uncompensated, um, uncompensated care, not less. And the reason for that is that a lot of people on Medicaid, Medicaid pays doctors so much less than private insurance does, that a lot of doctors don't take Medicaid, and a lot of people enrolled in Medicaid end up showing up in the emergency room to get basic care because they have a tough time finding a doctor that they can get a normal appointment with. So all this to say that the end result of the Affordable Care Act has been more federal spending, more taxpayer spending on health care, not less. Uh, and so to whatever degree the, the argument for Obamacare was that it would reduce the amount taxpayers spend on health care, uh, the opposite has happened. Cairo, Missouri. Jim, on our line for Democrats, you're next. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I've had several family members that resisted the uh, mandate. I did some research, went on the marketplace, and found, to their surprise, that there were plans available at no cost to them. Now, it wasn't good insurance, but it was some insurance. They had focused on paying, oh, i got to pay this fine if I don't get insurance and I can't afford it. Well, it was affordable. Um, another point, I signed up for Trump Care recently. Uh, my premiums had gone up 20%. My subsidy went up 20%. My insurance went from a 250 deductible to a $5,000 deductible. The government is paying more for less insurance for me. Like most people, I had insurance through my job all of my life. And 
Okay, Jim, we'll have Ovik Roy respond. Uh, those are all very important points that you've brought up, and uh, you know the experience that that you that you've had buying health insurance on in the open market is an experience that a lot of people are having. On average, s since 2013, so 2013 was the last year before the Obamacare regulations went into place. From then until 2017, Obamacare's last year in office, I mean, Obama's last year in office under Obamacare, premiums doubled on average, and they tripled or quadrupled for particularly younger people. Um, in your case, what you're experiencing, if you had to buy insurance in 2013, you're probably on average paying about 50 to 60 percent more. And to your point, as you mentioned, it's not just the premium that's gone up, it's also the deductible. And so this is one of the challenges with the Affordable Care Act that's been uh, both in terms of the people who support it and the people who oppose it, there's opposing views on this. Some people say it's worth it to spend all that extra money on health insurance because the insurance covers more things, it has more generous payouts in certain ways, uh, and that's better for you. Other people say, well, no, you're being forced to pay a lot more for health insurance than you otherwise would if you had your choice, and that's one of the flaws with Obamacare. And that debate, I think, is going to be with us for a very long time. Connie, uh, in New Jersey, Democrat. Uh, good morning. Morning, Connie. I, I want to ask this, uh, Mr. Roy, how is going to solve my problem? I make nineteen thousand dollars in my Social Security. From there, they take a hundred and something out for Medicare. I pay two hundred and seventy to AARP for my secondary, and I pay almost a hundred per Part D. So when this is a month, besides copays and medication, out of my nineteen thousand dollars a year income, I have a house that I pay nine thousand dollars in taxes. So here I'm in my golden years. I can move out of my house. I can take a vacation. I can take nothing. And this is the greatest nation in the world. They cannot figure out how to help the retired and the poor people. Tell me, Costa Rica, Banana Republic has better insurance than we have. Ovik Roy. Connie, again, all of your points are really great points. And this goes back to the way Medicare was originally designed when it was passed in 1965. The way Medicare was designed in 1965 set up basically what we've seen, 50 years of massive inflation in the cost of health care such that even though Medicare is very heavily subsidized, you, you described all the different premiums and co-pays that you pay uh, for your Medicare-based insurance. What you don't see is that actually there's another, for every dollar you're spending on your Medicare, there's another 2 to 3 to $4 that the rest of us are paying to subsidize the costs uh, on top of that. And that's because we have the most expensive health care system in the world because we, the, the federal decisions, federal policy decisions that were made in World War II and in the mid-1960s have given hospitals, doctors, drug companies, pretty much everybody an incentive to charge really, really high prices knowing that taxpayers will foot the bill. So that's the most important thing that we have to challenge uh, and tackle in health reform is how to get those underlying prices lower and we've done a poor job of that over the last 70 years. Joan, Hannibal, Missouri, on our line for Republicans. Morning to you. Yeah. Yes, good morning. Uh, I, I have watched C-SPAN every hour, every day that you've had these uh, sessions on in regard to the what we're talking about now. And finally, finally, Mr. Roy has found his way to your all's microphones to explain how this uh, this thing works so that I can understand. I'm 79 years old, and I understand what Mr. Roy is saying, and I thank him so much. Listen to him, folks. He's explaining it just like it will be if we can get this through. Thank you. This is the first time I've ever called, and I appreciate it. Oh, well, Joan, glad you called, and if you... Um, miss anything that Mr. Roy said, you can go back and watch it on cspan.org, but also you can follow him on Forbes.com. This is his latest piece, fact-checking Democratic claims about repealing Obamacare's individual mandate. Victoria in Oregon, a Democrat. Hi, Victoria. Good morning. Um, so I'm, this is my 51st year 
in as a practical practicing as a registered nurse, so I know a little bit about health care. The big problem has been fee for service. Uh, I won't get into that whole argument, but I think um, the Affordable Care Act in a lot of instances has really helped people. My daughter is a 46-year-old diabetic. She lost her health insurance when she lost her job a couple of years ago. She got onto the plan. She got subsidies. She got quite ill soon after she got her card from, um, as you like to call it, Obamacare. And basically, she wound up taking a lot of medications, being in an acute phase. She did recover from that. And basically, that helped her. She had to pay for things, but it wasn't at the cost that it would have been without insurance. So she used it for about nine months. Then she got a great job, probably double the salary she had before with wonderful health insurance. And she was taxed on those subsidies the following year, so she paid it back. So this is not a free ride for people, and I think it's very important. And I want to say I've worked for the oldest not-for-profit HMO in the country for 40 years, and they're a model for how good health care systems should work. Okay. Mr. Roy. Uh, there are a lot of great people trying to make uh, health care better in this country, absolutely, and, and you're one of them. And I will say it myself, as somebody who supports universal coverage, uh, the, I think the debate we're hoping, I hoped we have in this country about universal coverage is it's not just enough to say, let's have universal coverage. How you do it matters because there's only so much money to go around and the federal spending on health care because U.S. health care is so, so expensive is the primary driver of our deficit and our debt and what our grandchildren will pay off when they end up paying the bills for all this stuff. So we've got to figure out a way to make sure that we can get access to care and access to health insurance for everybody in a way that's affordable. And to do that, we have to do a bunch of things. One, we have to make sure that we tackle that biggest problem, the one we talked about earlier, the fact that U.S. health care is so much more expensive than any other country. There are ideas on the left to tackle that using price controls, and there are ideas on the right to tackle that using a more of a consumer-driven system, a more market-based approach. Both approaches can work to a degree, depending on how you implement them. But it is important to, I think, make sure that we not only make health insurance affordable by subsidizing it, but make sure that we make it less expensive. Because at the end of the day, we're all paying for those subsidies one way or another. And so the only way to really make the health, health, uh, health, excuse me, the health care system in America uh, affordable for everyone is to make sure that we tackle that underlying problem of how expensive it is. And Ovik Roy, what is your foundation? What is, this, what is your foundation doing about this problem? And also, who finances it? Great. So... The Foundation for Research on Equal Opportunity is a nonprofit think tank based in Austin, Texas, and we're building an office in Washington as well. Uh, we focus on ideas that move the needle, uh, policies, ideas for reform that make a difference for people with below median incomes or net worth. Uh, and so every single uh, piece of research we do, every scholar we try to hire or recruit, every op-ed we publish is all focused on uh, these issues related to uh, how we can make sure that the people who are being left behind in the 21st century economy can be brought back into it when their uh, opportunities can be expanded. So specifically on health care, we actually launched the Foundation for Research on Equal Opportunity a little over a year ago uh, with a big white paper on how to achieve market-based universal coverage, a bipartisan approach in which we use and deploy the most innovative ideas out there in the private sector, whether it's insurers, nurses, HMOs, hospitals, doctors, innovative drug companies, technology, digital health, uh, to try to marshal all, all, all those great actors to say, how can we make health insurance and health care more affordable for the people who can least afford it today and make that system fiscally sustainable for the future? So that's our big push and our big focus when it comes to health care reform. And finally, who finances your foundation? We're financed by individuals, foundations, stakeholders, corporations, basically the standard range of funders that uh, fund most think tanks in the country. Do you have any personal large donors? No. Diane, DeSoto, Kansas, Republican. Uh, good morning, uh, Mr. Roy. You are doing a phenomenal job of explaining things. I've got kind of a complicated uh, scenario for you to try to set me straight on. The Affordable Care Act, when it was initially passed, as I recall, it was paid for in part by $700 billion in cuts to Medicare. Now, under this new GOP proposal, I understand there are also cuts to Medicare. 
Now, that's one, one thing. The second thing is I'm a senior citizen, and I know by doing some research and also hearing on from some uh, pundits on television, what's going to change for senior citizens is that they will lose the deduction, the extra deduction. I don't know if it's 1500 or 1700 something like that, that they pre- currently are getting uh, on our taxes. We will lose that. On top of that, we will lose our uh, medical deductions. And on top of that, the first, uh, was uh, currently we're paying taxes at a rate on the, on, of 10% uh, on the first part of our income, but it's going to be kicked up to 12%. So it looks to me like <clears throat> all the, uh, the cuts that are being made to Medicare were also, the seniors are also getting cut on the benefits that they were getting from Medicare. Can you please explain this to me and who thought this up and is it going to go through? Thank you. Yeah, so uh, it's conceivable that there's some provision that I'm not familiar with in uh, in the in the in the tax reform bills that uh, that are that just passed the House and the one that just passed the Senate Finance Committee. But I'm not aware of any provisions that would cut Medicare spending. Um, uh, and in general, as we talked about earlier with the Joint Committee on Taxation's report out on the uh, on the Republican tax bill in the Senate. Pretty much every tax bracket would see a tax cut. The only asterisks that are people who would voluntarily not buy health insurance under Obamacare's individual mandate, who would forego a tax benefit for signing up for Obamacare voluntarily. Uh, but I'm not aware of anything that involves uh, Medicare cuts or anything like that. Uh, many seniors, particularly those who are in a middle income to lower income tax bracket, should actually see reduced taxes under this bill. And those who have retirement accounts like 401ks, if, uh, if, uh, if this bill, if, if these bills actually pass and they succeed in stimulating the economy, that should lead to a pretty significant uptick in the stock market, which should actually help a lot of people in their retirement years who are withdrawing uh, from their 401ks. One more question here for Mr. Roy. Gary in Moorfield, West Virginia, Democrat. Yeah, good morning. Um, on your uh, mandate there that uh, you're saying is a tax, and uh, if I remember correctly, when the uh, Affordable Care Act was done, it was there more or less as a backup because there's not enough young people. You know, I've got a lot of children and grandchildren, and I put my years in and I've retired. So it's their turn to kind of take care of me. Well, it seems to me like you all are trying to take that away. And no matter what you say or how you put it, it's going to go it's going to make medical stuff go up i have been around a long time and i have never ever seen insurance come down because if you do if you have then i i have some oceanfront property in colorado to sell you because i'll tell you <laughs> that's, that's 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 how it works okay Ovik well, roy what do you think well uh, there are two things to say to that. One, there is one program in which premiums have, amazingly enough, declined year over year for quite some time, and that's the Medicare Prescription Drug Benefit Program, where premiums have come in way under budget and way under expectations over the last several years because of the very clever way that that program was designed when it was passed in 2003 uh, uh, in a bipartisan way between Democrats and Republicans under George W. Bush. So that's the one area of success in terms of premiums declining. Broadly speaking to your question, there is, again, as far as I'm aware, no changes to the taxes or spending that involve Medicare. If you're retired, you're eligible for Medicare. Uh, there's no change to the Medicare payroll tax in this legislation. So the people, people like myself who are younger, we're going to be paying the same taxes to support Medicare that we always have. And in terms of being on Medicare, there are no spending cuts in this bill uh, that affect Medicare at all, because it's a tax bill. There's no spending cuts, nothing related to Medicare in that regard. Again, it's conceivable that there's some provision I'm not aware of, but I'm not aware of anything that involves Medicare in this bill. So in that regard, you should be OK. You can follow the work of Ovik Roy if you go to F-R-E-O-P-P dot org. That's the website for the foundation, but also a contributor to Forbes.com. We thank you for the conversation this morning. Thank you very much, Greta.